effort uh, getting URIs, um, but we're on the mend. Um, so um, hope everybody else is doing well wherever you are and um, excited to hear a, uh, uh, a case from somebody. Hopefully someone has one and then we'll invite two discussants as always. Um, yeah, first timers, highly encouraged. Uh, returning discussants, of course, welcome and would love, um, love for um, one of the discussants to be um, a woman. So in the meantime, um, I will uh, just share some, um, share yesterday's case along with some uh, learning points. It was a very interesting and challenging one uh, presented uh, by Mar um, uh, oh my God, uh, Marco? Mario. Fra Fra Franco, Franco. Oh, Franco. And discussed by um, Mario, uh, as well as Hannah, whose name I saw. I think Hannah is here again today. Um, thank you for joining Hannah. And uh, Aaron, of course, was uh, facilitating. And uh, the case was a young young woman um, had a history of hypothyroidism as well as um, an adrenal adenoma. You know, not not super common for that age, right? Uh, but uh, but otherwise feeling you know healthy generally, and had been feeling really well um, until the the day of presentation. Um, but she. Um, was brought to the ED uh, by her family for hallucinations and um, where she had started to see um, spiders and other things, as well as just for what was called incoherent speech and, um, and uh, incontinence, urinary incontinence. And this was all seemed to be a very um, hyperacute sort of presentation. Um, so some of the interesting things that were discussed early on is just this sort of um, uh, this term incoherent speech, but that's often like what we perceive, right? Like someone is, is trying to speak and we, we don't understand them, right? And how it could mean so many different things. Um, you know, it could be actual aphasia, right? It could be um, dysarthria, or it could be just global encephalopathy where, you know, your language is fine, your expression is fine, uh, but you're, you're, you're not making sense, right? Um, uh, and then the other kind of high yield global learning point was just uh, the onset um, and how it was truly seemed to be sort of hyper acute. And um, I always love um, Robbie's sort of framework of things that come on, you know, in a, in a second or minute, uh, either something got blocked, like vascular, something ruptured or tore, like a bleed or like a viscous or whatever, or there was a change in uh, electrical activity. In this case, you know, for neurologic complaints, it would be um, seizure. So um, this lady on exam um, uh, had a very, uh, you know, interesting appearance. So um, her pulse was 140, she, her temperature was a little elevated um, and uh, she was very disoriented, um, but also had midriasis and both hand and tongue tremor. Mm. Um, and um, Hannah and uh, Mario and Aaron discussed how like, it really seemed like a toxidrome almost, right? Um, as well as the possibility of her being thyrotoxic, you know, with that appearance. But her TFTs were actually normal, and all the other workup was also really negative. Her LP was pretty stone cold normal, MRI was fine. Um, and um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped an important part. She seized at presentation um, and then ended up, uh, you know, in status in ICU, et cetera. Um, but all the workup was negative, um, including uh, autoantibodies for autoimmune encephalitis. Um, and the only positive finding was a, a very high titer of antithyroperoxidase antibody in the serum. And the diagnosis was of um, Hashimoto encephalopathy, which Aaron was saying um, that it's almost sort of um, uh, an entity uh, that has been described, but is under doubt about whether it's its own thing, especially in the setting of the exploding field of autoimmune um, you know, neurology and how uh, we're discovering so many new autoantibodies and phenotypes of autoimmune encephalitis. So, um, <clears throat> and given how, what, what the, what, how common it is to just have um, both autoimmune thyroid disease, but even if you don't have hypothyroidism, you can have 
autoantibodies for for thyroperoxidase, um, whether it's all been really just like a basically a um, an imagined entity. Mm. Now, in the setting of the most common autoantibodies being tested for here and for um, the um, the LP also being normal, you know, Aaron said this. This you know, it's not clear yet. This could this could indeed have been. Hashimoto encephalopathy, the patient received steroids and improved. Um, and, um, but it was just interesting to just, and humbling to, to think about like how, how vague a lot of these syndromes are and how little we actually know, but that thankfully we're, we're, we're making progress in understanding this sort of like category of diseases. The other interesting uh, learning point for me um, was that, um, the air was saying, you know, it's very common for patients to present with sort of like, you know, nonspecific neurologic symptoms or suspicion for stroke, you know, like it's, it's the very acute onset or it's not clear what else is going on and no one witnessed them seize at home. So that's like, it's a possibility, but you never really know for sure. And then while you're with them, they, they seize in front of you. And it, and it's always hard to tell whether some of the presenting symptoms are associated with the same thing that caused the seizure, like a brain tumor, hmm. right? Or whether they were actually um, postictal symptoms, right? And it, this is a primary seizure disorder. disorder. Um, and uh, one thing I, I hadn't appreciated, but it makes perfect sense, is just like you can get motor Todd's paralysis, you can get like aphasia as a postictal um, symptom, for example, and it's basically like Todd's paralysis of Broca's area. Um, so, um, that was mm. never in my differential, like if someone presents with, you know, aphasia or something else, it's like, it's a postictal phenomenon that's going to self-resolve. That's, uh, that's all I had, but definitely a fascinating and challenging case and a really, uh, fun discussion by, uh, by everybody. Um, so, um, how are we doing? Do we, uh, do we have any case or any discussions so far? Lots of encouragement, but no bites yet. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a recent case that I could share with you and Anne-Marie as, as backup, but we're super excited for any of you in the audience to hop on, chat through, or share uh, something interesting that you saw recently. Nalayan, awesome. <clears throat> We'd love to have you, fantastic. So we'd love another discussant to join the lay-in and uh, if anyone has got a uh, case in mind. Hey Steph, I just wanted to mention that today we do not have anyone for teaching points, but maybe I can try to do both at the same time. So I will maybe keep teaching points brief and short, but there is no one else. So I will try my best to do both things. If anyone can do it, Kirtan, I think it's, I think it's you. <laughs> and Anne-Marie has a case also. Cool. Um, what do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm game, I'm game for whatever. I just love, love hearing, love hearing cases, love presenting them. Let's, uh, yeah, Anne-Marie, we can uh, chat through your case <coughs> and we'll just wait for one more person to join uh, me and Zavin and uh, Nalayan with uh, chatting through it. Um, are, are you ready, Kirtan? Do we, um, Nilayan, you want to um, you wanna say hi to everybody real quick? And um, we'd love to have one, uh, one other discussant if, if um, anyone would like. Oh, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Nilayan. I'm, I'm talking from India. I'm a fourth year medical student from New Delhi, India. And um, can I say I'm an old timer? I don't feel like an old timer. It still feels so good to be here. And uh, good news from India, we are uh, opening up. And um, vaccination, uh, I live in Delhi, so which is the national capital region. 
and the vaccination rates here um, is around 33 percent and um, at this point we are expecting a fourth wave of covid around october but the good news is that the peak uh, the expected peak is almost half as much as we uh, had just a few months back so good times or maybe moderate times to look ahead good luck to yourself thanks Noe. And I know you were here with us uh, last Wednesday, so it's great to have you again. And uh, Franco is available also. I think this was our tag team uh, last Wednesday too. Um, yeah, Franco, if you want to go ahead and say hi, um, we'll team up with you guys again. I love enjoying discussing with Nilay and the other team and the whole team last Wednesday. It will be a lot of fun. Well, I'm Franco. I am from Peru. Uh, funny fact is that today is Peru Independence Day. We are commemorating 200 years of independence today. <laughs> Happy Independence Day. Yeah. All right. Um, Anne-Marie, we'll have you kick things off. And then maybe um, if uh, Franco and Zavin want to pair up, you guys can go on the first section. And then uh, Nalayan and I will follow in the subsequent section. All right. Okay, um, so we have a case of a 36 year old male with a past medical history of Crohn's disease, status post ileal resection, and end ileostomy, um, who is presenting for um, a right upper lung mass evaluation, as well as a recent episode of syncope and acute kidney injury. The patient had presented to a neighboring hospital a week ago after reporting an episode of feeling lightheaded and having several um, jerking episodes um, where a CT of the chest was obtained. And they noted this right upper uh, lobe lesion that they told was concerning for malignancy at that time, um, declined evaluation and biopsy at um, that hospital, but then um, later was still like feeling really bad. And so uh, presented again a week later. Um, in regards to that episode, um, he felt like he was having tensing and jolting all over um, the body, um, had had really high ostomy output um, recently, um, did not have a post ictal um, state at that time, but has felt like his balance is um, really off. Um, and then he has had um, some weight loss um, recently. It kind of his weight fluctuates, but it's um, down about um, 10 pounds. Um, he has trouble keeping up with his ostomy output. Um, will often have to change the pouch five to 10 times a day, but there's no, currently no like bloody output um, from the um, out. He has noticed a little redness um, at the, the site. And I will leave it there. Holy moly, Anne-Marie. What, what, <laughs> what an explosive uh, uh, case intro with, with um, so much to talk about. Um, this poor young guy. Um, uh, Nilayan, yes, mm -hmm. Nilayan. Um, what? How, how do you? How do you even want to organize this? There's, there's just so much going on. Um, get us started. Uh, yeah, sure. As you said, so, so many things going on, and I think uh, the time course will be key here. Uh, but before I lay that on, I just have this thought that uh, let us start with this. Maybe the crowns wasn't isn't crowns. It's maybe just simple colitis and. Maybe we somehow got uh, Crohn's confused with other cases of colitis. And if you marry colitis with cancer, uh, I think uh, autoimmune disorders, auto or deficiency disorders, really come um, really come forth. So something like IPEX, I really studied it, so I wanted to say that aloud. So IPEX has colitis, features of colitis, and uh, some autoimmune uh, autoimmune deficiencies, uh, um, immune deficiencies with cancer. Uh, cancer is mostly lymphoreticular cancer and not been lung cancer. Basically, I'm, I was equating uh, right of a cotton lung mass with some sort of um, lymphoreticular cancer. So if you marry lymphoreticular cancer with colitis, you can have something like IPEX, which uh, I'm not sure the full form of, but it's basically a form of immune deficiency or disorder. So yeah, keeping that aside, uh, as you said, so many things going on. So yeah, we will uh, take this. Uh, uh, we will uh, use the uh, we will use the time course to uh, help us sort things out. 
so crons came first so uh, i'll keep crons uh, aside and with crons we have a right upper quadrant mass and i think uh, kushal mentioned in chat that it could be a manifestation of crons as some like necrobiotic nodules but uh, what if the patient has some really bad genetics and it's crons with a cancer and with cancer you can have paraneoplastic syndromes and that would expect uh, this uh, light headedness jerking syncope uh, paraneoplastic uh, paraneoplastic syndromes can present that way and uh, but a mass is a mass and it doesn't need to be cancer it can be so many things uh, if you talk about indian context i think uh, crons as uh, colitis is often confused with tb tb is a very uh, good differential diagnosis there because it also causes adhesions and strictures and it can mimic crons clinically uh, i'm sure this person might have uh, must have received a microbiological uh, uh, microscopic uh, diagnosis of crons but if you talk about uh, if you talk about clinical manifestations tb of intestines uh, mimics crons and if you uh, Uh, if you have that then right upper quadrant mass can be tb or uh, some sort of a mass there or maybe it was tb or uh, it was tb it was treated and then it has a secondary infection something like aspergillomas it can present this way we have had cases um apart from that a uh, concern for malignancy yeah i uh, i echo that point that yeah i am worried about malignancy because that's how i can explain with paraneoplastic syndrome i can explain the other features like tensing and jerking um high ostomy output yeah So high ostomy output. I think we had this case in which uh, the final diagnosis was CMV uh, colitis, if I'm not wrong. Um, high ostomy outputs can be so so many things. Um, there is some diversion uh, diversion colitis that is seen with uh, that is seen with any uh, cases of ostomies, uh, which can be a consideration here. Uh, but given the fact that the patient is on crons, he must be on some sort of immunosuppressive therapies. So infections can also be a very good uh, uh, should be on a radar that some sort of infection can present with, uh, can present this way. as we saw with cmv but uh, cmv was just one we can have um, maybe cryptococcus uh, okay not cryptococcus um, sorry there are some parasites uh, which are very common in immune immune deficiency i'm forgetting their names but um, they uh, they basically uh, live in the small intestines and that's how they can cause watery diarrhea they are mostly uh, associated with aids but um, with aids you have immune deficiency here you can also have some sort of immune suppression so maybe we can have that in our head and um denise ectal episode so yeah maybe we were looking at uh, some sort of seizures and we are not looking at that uh, but um yeah in doses uh, off balance okay so off balance can have so many reasons it can be something um, cerebellar it can be um, a normal pressure hydrocephalus but as we uh, learned yesterday that non- normal pressure hydrocephalus is mostly a both thing and not a real life scenario so yeah i was equating this with more like metabolic disturbances um but it can be uh, i think we are open it can be infection it can be malignancy it can be uh, it can be uh, paraneoplastic it can even be auto uh, endocrine we never know it can be uh, as i said ipex ipex has um, some auto endocrine uh, aspect to it as well so it can be endocrine as well uh, for now uh, it's um, the list is huge and i really can't um, narrow it down to to anything wow um wasn't that amazing <laughs> Stephanie and that was uh just such a such a beautiful discussion um addressing all of the you know complicated abnormalities with a lot of very solid kind of hypotheses which are very different from each other. I'm really glad you started to bring in information that we don't yet have like the presumption that the patient is on amino you know suppressive medications which we'll find out soon enough but um Yeah, I think everything you said is just um uh very spot on and, and entirely possible. I'm I'm trying to like um do two things. Uh incorporate uh sort of base rates and pretest probabilities. So um one is that uh you know, depending on who this patient is and where this geography is, the possibility of a uh, you know tb ileitis uh being uh misdiagnosed as crohn's and then being started on amino suppressants and then exploding and disseminating into the lungs into the brain elsewhere um y- you know would be very different for for example in delhi um than in denver right um so um similarly you know if this 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 could be a lung cancer right but how commonly do 36 year olds um get lung cancer and how commonly do 36 year olds with crohn's and immunosuppression get lung cancer as opposed to infections right in the in the lung that can present with mass like lesions um so those are sort of the the some of the pretest um kind of base rate considerations to 
to help potentially focus um, the evaluation some. And then the, the other thing I'm trying to do is find ways to simplify the case. Because right now it's just like, there's just so much going on, right? And yes, a, a, a widely disseminated infection or widely disseminated malignancy could explain all of these kind of multifocal symptoms. Um, but, um, you know, one way that the case could be simplified is if we, you know, sort of saw physical exam findings that the patient was like extremely volume depleted, right? So suddenly the lightheadedness and the syncope, it's like, especially if we get more history, it's like, okay, all right, they were just orthostatic, right? Like that's not, that's not like a problem that's going to really factor into our, our diagnostic thinking. Or say this patient has been having so much diarrhea that they're like potassium and magnesium and calcium are like all in the toilet, just like very, very low, right? Suddenly, you know, some degree of, of myoclonus or jerking or neuromuscular irritability doesn't necessarily localize to the CNS as much and could just be metabolic, as you mentioned, the lion. So, you know, and certainly like you didn't even, you, you talk about the AKI, for example, right? Which, which I think is perfectly appropriate because it's one of these things on the problem list that's like probably will be quickly simplified, right? By the history of this like excessive ostomy output, you know, the patient's own words of like not keeping up with how much is he's losing the dizziness, the lightheadedness, uh, all of that kind of ties together as a secondary complication rather than a clue to the, to finding out the primary process. Um, cool. Uh, amazing case so far. Thank you, Nalayan. A great, uh, a great discussion. Uh, Anne Marie, tell us more, please. Okay. As far as past medical history, the Crohn's disease, as mentioned, um, was not able to be on immunosuppressive therapy for the last two years due to financial issues had previously been on a TNF alpha inhibitor and then had had the um, endoleostomy due to complications of that. Um, otherwise, um, history of depression and then um, high ostomy output as well um, as um, opioid use disorder. And then as far as social history, um, smoked a pack per a day for the last um, about like 15 years. And then um, as far as the, um, sorry, it was currently sexually active um, with a female partner in monogamous. As far as the vital signs um, was a febrile on admission, um, heart rate was in the 120s. Um, blood pressure was about 100 over 70. Um, respiratory rate um, was 18 and um, saturating um, well on ambient air at the time. As, as far as the initial evaluation um, was in no acute distress, um, there were no cervical lymphadenopathy on exam. Um, the heart was tachycardic, but no murmurs. Um, there was some coarse breath sounds in the right upper lobe, but otherwise the lungs were clear to auscultation. Um, the abdomen was soft um, with the ostomy in place with brown a liquid stool um, seen in some mild erythema without purulence um, or signs of abscess at the ostomy um, site. And then um, the extremities were um, well perfused. There was no cyanosis. And then as far as the neuro exam, the cranial nerves um, were intact. Um, the strength was five out of five and equal in the bilateral upper and lower extremities. Um, deep tendon reflexes were normal and sensation was intact and cerebellar testing was normal. And then I think I will leave it there. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention um, medications prior to admission. Um, 
So medications prior to admission included um, clonazepam um, that was just as needed, um, Adderall, Nexium, Imodium, um, Suboxone, Trazodone, and Epsor. I guess I should say venlafaxine, and I will leave it there. Thank you. And just to clarify, Marie, um, there is no current uh, anti-TNF uh, drug, right? It's been several years. Okay. Yeah, it's not in the past um, two years due to access issues. Thank you. All right, Franco, what are your thoughts? Okay, so we definitely have a uh, Crohn that is not controlled. So there's a lot of inflammation going on. Yeah, he has been off the medication for three years. And we have already be he has he has been already have some reception from the from, from this. So there is a lot of things that can go on if there's inflammation present. Also, some patients with uh, anti-TNF alpha tend to in the long term be at increased risk, risk of lymphoma. That could also be a person in the in the lung, and could also have some uh, GI involvement. So that could be another thing to think about it. Definitely, the social history and the and the smoking. We don't have to forget about a small cell lung, a small cell lung carcinoma being the smoking one of the most risk factors for that for that disease that can explain the lung mass. Um, Although he's not that, uh, there are no signs of dehydration, but he only has some elevated heart rate. So that could fit in the dehydration. So I will be highly interested in about how are the electrolytes that could, uh, could really explain all the, all the dizziness, all the lightheadedness, uh, all the presyncope as David said uh, earlier. Also, we have a mass here in the, in the in lungs, so it can do some sort of pressure, some kind of messing with the baroreceptors uh, that could explain that. Uh, I think right now that the crown is not, uh, it's kind of maybe noise, maybe just the thing that in the high output tend to reveal or tend to overexpress something that was going on already in the lung. And uh, I think from that, I think that's where I am thinking. Fantastic work, Franco, just tying on sort of the problem list that was generated by Nalayan and Zavin with this additional kind of information in the physical exam skills. Um, I, I am similarly uh, thinking about the sort of lung mass as the most perhaps specific issue to really start tackling to figure out what's driving all of this. Um, but of all the many problems on the problem list that um, we've discussed so far, to me, the other two that stand out uh, as perhaps kind of true signal of the primary issue are these jerking episodes and then the high ostomy of output. For me, sort of tackling those three issues right now seem to be the priority to get us towards the answer because as Zavin said, some of the other symptoms he's having, the lightheadedness, um, perhaps ongoing renal dysfunction, we may hear about that might tie into those particular problems. Um, so actually to sort of frame my thoughts on those three issues, if Anne-Marie, if I could ask just a couple more history questions. Mm -hmm. We heard the lung mass was found on a CAT scan that was just done actually in his evaluation for the presyncope. Um, I'm curious, uh, did, has he had any pulmonary symptoms at all? Cough, dyspnea, chest discomfort, uh, pleuritic mm -hmm. chest pain, anything like that. Yeah, um, he's had a little bit of like kind of chronic shortness of breath, um, but it's not been like a predominant um, feature really more upon evaluation. Um, no frank hemoptysis um, noted um, and has not really had a significant cough during the time. Got it. So that's really helpful to know that there's a big mass there, but at least so far it's been 
nearly asymptomatic, right? This is sort of incidentally found, um, could cause this gentleman serious problems, but right now is perhaps subclinical. Um, I guess my other question, Anne-Marie, is with these episodes of tensing and jerking, uh, what the time course uh, for those is? Honestly, since I'm like doing this very last minute, I don't have as good of like history on that. Um, they don't last for long and there's not like a post-ictal state after, um, but I think like a few minutes. Great. And then um, same question, just with the, the high alstomy of output, has that been more of a recent phenomenon for him or part of his daily life for a while? It's been going on since um, getting the um, ileos and ileostomy. It's been kind of an ongoing struggle and there's been some titration of um, medications and everything since that time to try to prevent myostomy output. Great, thank you. Um, for each of those three issues, I think knowing the time course really factors into what our differential diagnosis should be. So um, for what I would now call a perhaps asymptomatic or subclinical lung mass, um, to me that suggests perhaps some chronicity to that mass evolving. And more of a chronic process I think is important to know because that does raise our concern for more indolent involving infections that the group has brought up already without any recent TNF um, inhibition. Uh, hopefully TB isn't likely, but more chronic infectious processes like mycobacterial in general and fungal, uh, chronic malignant evolution, whether lymphoma, as Franco pointed out, or otherwise, are still at the top of the list compared to more acute problems, right? If this was an acute bacterial pneumonia that had right upper lung consolidation, we'd expect this guy to be symptomatic. So to me, that's where this sort of time course um, comes in pretty pertinently. Um, I guess similarly, other inflammatory causes for the neck mass, excuse me, lung mass that aren't infectious or malignant could include sort of auto, autoimmune pathology. We've talked before about certain uh, vasculinities causing lung nodules. Um, again, more of a subacute to chronic time for, course keeps that category on the list. Um, in terms of the, the chronicity, I guess we're not entirely sure how long the jerking has been going on, uh, but assuming it hasn't started right away, it also makes me wonder about problems that have been evolving to drive that <coughs> neuromuscular activity. Electrolyte disarray, as um, Zavin and Nalayan discussed, and now that we've found a lot of these um, uh, psychoactive and neuroactive medications, I think wondering about kind of medication effect, either a buildup in the setting of renal dysfunction or a withdrawal, for example, from benzodiazepines, if he hasn't been taking them as much recently, are kind of important to, to put on the list for this uh, jerking, which is um, you know, has an unclear time course. Uh, and then finally, the high ostomy output, having some chronicity is really helpful, particularly in the setting of knowing his Crohn's is really untreated right now. And so big question on my mind is how much of this is ongoing inflammatory bowel disease and other areas of his gut that weren't resected yet. Um, that really is sort of paramount on my mind, knowing that he's been off treatment right now. Similarly, with the chronicity being there, I think um, withdrawal syndrome being off any of his, his suboxone, for example, opioid withdrawal just doesn't fit, right? And so all of this is to say for each of these three, three main issues, which is I think what we really need to focus on, um, the longer time course really informs what the differential diagnosis is for these. Um, I think I'll just stop there and we'll see how things evolve going forward. Okay, um, awesome. So as far as the CBC, the CBC showed a WBC of 7.5 with a normal differential aside from lymphopenia to 1.4, um, but otherwise was normal, no eosinophil. Yeah, noted. Um, hemoglobin was 13.2, which was uh, near kind of baseline around 12 of hemoglobin, and platelets were 337. Um, the CMP on admission showed a sodium of 136, a potassium of 4.1, a chloride of 93, a um, CO2 of 31, 
a BUN of 24 and a creatinine of two from a baseline around one. Um, glucose level was normal and um, calcium level was normal as well. Um, the, otherwise, the rest of the hepatic function panel was normal aside from elevated albumin at 4.7. No gamma gut was noted. Um, lipase level was within the normal range. Um, magnesium level was 0.7. And then um, phosphorus level was also within the normal range and um, lactic acid was 2.6. Um, troponin level was negative, um, CK was within the normal range, and um, CRP level was um, less than five. Henry, are, are these the right person's labs? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Urinalysis um, showed six RBCs, um, but otherwise was normal. Um, and I will leave it there. Uh, can, can I ask a, a couple of uh, follow up questions? Sorry. Um, yeah. were, were there orthostatics checked at, at any point? I'm not, I'm not sure if they were um, checked upon admission. I think um, there was orthostasis at some point during hospitalization, but I don't remember if they were checked at this point. Okay, okay cool. Um, thank you, Henry. Um, Franco, um, you, can, you can discuss whatever you want, but something I'm really curious to hear is, because this is kind of what I thought was like, whether any of the labs sort of like surprised you, which is why I was sort of jokingly asking Anne Marie, like, what did you expect as you discuss some of these numbers? Like, what did you expect them to be? Like, why are some of them a little bit like not, you know, just, just a little bit surprising relative to, to the pretest based on the history and physical? Well, um, oh, hey, I'm sorry. Oh, I, think, I think. Yes, Nilayan. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. That's all right. You can. Sure, go ahead, Nilayan. It's your turn. Okay, sure. So, uh, yeah, lymphopenia was a bit surprising here, uh, and hemoglobin of 13.2, very healthy. I didn't expect a patient with chronic prons to have a hemoglobin of 13.2, anemia of chronic illness, just kick in, and put also the person for keeping it that high. Yeah, lymphopenia was a bit surprising, but um, yeah. So, with lymphopenia, I had two thoughts. Maybe if this person has an infection, which is causing lymphopenia, because that is possible, or lymphopenia predisposed this person to some infection. But um, we are considering infection in the absence of any uh, raised temperature. So, uh, yeah, and uh, CRP also being normal. So we don't have any acute sense of inflammation here. So uh, we, have a, uh, we have a probable case of infection if you are considering infections at all, which uh, is not acute, so subacute infection or maybe chronic. Um, so I don't expect chronic uh, to present this acutely. So we have some sort of subacute uh, infection going on, which produces lymphopenia. And I believe the differential is there is uh, very uh, thin. I don't know what it is, but I expect it to be very thin. Um, yeah, something like TB came to my mind, but I don't think that TB presents with lymphopenia. Um, um, maybe um, typhoid does, but yeah, I'm just guessing here what infections present with lymphopenia has. Um, apart from that, uh, yeah, creatinine of uh, baseline, creatinine of two. And interesting thing was uh, on urine analysis, we got the RBV. So as, I think as we discussed, as we have discussed before, uh, Crohn's disease can present with the stones. And renal stones can have a positive RBC. Or uh, had it this had this been some sort of pre-renal AKI sort of picture, I think I would have expected to see some sort of casts along with RBCs, maybe some sort of uh, some WBCs apart from RBCs. But if we are having uh, like if the RBCs were dysmorphic, uh, I think uh, I am sure that urine analysis must have uh, included some sort of microscopy, urine microscopy. And if the RBCs were dysmorphic, then we are looking at a pre-renal AKI sort of picture or renal AKI sort of picture. But if the RBCs are well formed, we are looking at uh, post uh, renal uh, AKI, maybe some sort of infection, some sort of obstruction, secondary to uh, most likely a stone. Um, apart from that, no gamma gap. No gamma gap um, is interesting, maybe because uh, in Crohn's, as in any chronic inflammation, of gamma gap, we can expect gamma gap. But in the absence of any gamma gap, in, in the presence of lymphopenia, I think we can safely keep um, lymphoma 
we can uh, I think we can uh, keep lymphoma out of our uh, differential list. Apart from that, um, yeah, I think this point that uh, his ostomy was a slightly erythematous. That is a very interesting point because um, I think we read in surgery that uh, in ostomies, excoriation is the most common complaint that the present presents with acute. Excoriations are very common and we have to differentiate excoriations with an acute inflammation of the ostium that can present with erythema. I think tenderness would be a good way to do that, but uh, I'm not sure uh, if there are any better methods because uh, theoretically inflammation should be very common uh, of the ostomy, not just the skin because excoriation represents the inflammation of the overlying skin. And with, erythema, uh, and with erythema, I expect some sort of anastomotic, um, anastomotic inflammation or a leak there. Uh, apart from that, uh, yeah, uh, this one uh, fun fact jumped to my mind that uh, the person is smoking uh, for 15 years and smoke, we know that smoking ex exacerbates uh, uh, this Crohn's disease. It, um, it apparently is curative for ulcerative colitis, but it, uh, it worsens Crohn's disease. So I think I would like to ask the person if, uh, if he has had any recent changes in smoking pattern, maybe he has raised it as addicts all, almost always do. Or maybe he has given up. Maybe that is causing some sort of exacerbation. And yeah, TNF alpha. So TNF alpha can cause so many things. I'm not sure if TNF alpha can cause um, cancer, but TNF alpha can certainly cause the activation of certain viruses, which can present in the brain and cause what we are seeing, some sort of um, encephalitis picture. I'm pretty sure this is not encephalitis, but uh, maybe um, some um, focal infection by a virus. TNF alpha can do that. And uh, TNF alpha can it present with lymphopenia? I'm not sure, but I think it can. So uh, if we can explain lymphopenia with TNF alpha, then we are uh, really looking into some sort of infection here. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Nilayan. Great discussion. Um, uh, anyway, just to clarify, the lymphopenia, the 1.4 is the absolute count, is 1,400, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's relatively, uh, that's kind of borderline. That's sort of mild lymphopenia. And I'll say that in, in people who are acutely ill, stressed, whatever, it's a very common and nonspecific finding. Um, the endogenous uh, corticosteroid response to stress um, does have a, a lympholytic effect. Um, so uh, whether you're having an MI or are super dehydrated from diarrhea or you know, um, are, are sick in any other way, um, it's very common to have, you know, an absolute lymphocyte count in the, even in the triple digits. Um, and acutely, that doesn't necessarily portend like an elevated risk of infection. Now, the flip side is, I don't know in the line if TNF-alpha inhibitors um, cause lymphopenia directly, but even if they don't, they certainly are very immunosuppressive through, you know, their direct anti-TNF um, effects. My only question is how long does that immunosuppression last, right? If the last dose was two years ago, can there still be a setup for opportunistic infections? And, you know, the direct effect of it isn't, doesn't last two years, but it is entirely possible to be predisposed to opportunistic infections, whether tuberculous uh, or mycobacterial, fungal, viral, um, because of the TNF inhibitor. And then even when you stop it, for it to have sort of a chronic protracted, you know, waxing, waning um, battle with your, with your immune system that eventually sort of like manifests later. I wouldn't be surprised at all by that. Um, your question of whether they predispose to cancer, they do. It's usually uh, lymphomas as well as cutaneous malignancies. I don't think they predispose to primary lung cancers, um, but it's, it's, it's certainly on the table. Um, so... Uh, I think your, your, your renal discussion was, um, was, was great. I don't have too much to add to that. One, one, one other thing that stood out to me was like the BUN wasn't, you know, disproportionately elevated to the creatinine um, that you would expect in a dehydrated patient. Um, so, but maybe the patient is malnutrition and that's why, although we're not clearly getting a signal for that either, you know, the albumin is 4.7, which again, that could reflect hemoconcentration too, along with the hemoglobin. Um, so there's a little bit of just like a mixed, mixed pictures. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out that was just, this is just a good general lab interpretation point is that people who are having a lot of diarrhea, ostomy output, whatever, um, they, they lose a lot of bicarbonate and they should have a non-GAP metabolic acidosis. So it's a little bit weird for this patient to have a CO2 of 31. It's a little bit weird to have a potassium that is 
you know, normal, especially when the mag is actually 0.7 is very low. I don't know if there's a different normal range, but I don't think so. That um, is your assay, Anne Marie, is y'all's less than 1.6 is abnormal for magnesium? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's that's our assay. So it's a little bit, you know, uh, unusual that it's like an isolated electrolyte that is so, so depleted. Um, you know, things that are kind of preferentially uh, maguric um, uh, via the kidneys uh, include um, uh, thiazides, uh, ethanol, um, uh, platinum chemotherapies, um, but uh, the patient doesn't have a history of any of those things. Uh, things that are that impair uh, intestinal magnesium absorption include PPIs, uh, but the patient isn't on any any PPIs. I think he was. Oh, was wasn't he? he? Did we miss the PPI just on the list, Anne Marie? I may have just misheard. I, I thought I heard one, but anyway, anyway we'll, we'll get the check on that. But anyway, that just sort of like stands out. Whether or not a, a, a magnesium level that low can explain some of this, like some of these neuromuscular jerking things, um, maybe. But at this point, overall, the biochemical profile is like normalish enough that basically these normal labs point me more towards the lung mass as Steph was saying as like the, the thing to go after as well as potentially raising my concern for actual CNS pathology and wanting in this clinical context, at least some brain imaging to start. Um, and so um, yeah, I guess that's, that's sort of uh, all there is to say about that. And um, uh, I suspect the next um, set of information might include um, some details on that, Emery. The patient was on a PPI. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I have sent Kurtan a picture of the CTA that was obtained on admission. Did not show a PE. Um, I'll show just a. I'll have him show you just a slice of the image. Um, also received a CT of the abdomen. Um, that did not show any acute changes. Um, and an MRI of the brain was also obtained, um, which also did not show any acute changes. Um, did have a cortisol level that was obtained that was 1.4. HIV was, and that was at like 5.30 in the morning. HIV was um, negative at that time. Um, and then kind of after you see the image, I'll let you ask for kind of any further labs or workup that you want. Yes, so Steph, I will try to show and let me know if I am zooming it. It will be difficult, but I will try my best. Uh, can you see it? Or? Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Cool. Hold that position. <laughs> and that's in the right upper lobe. And um, Emery, would you agree the description is, you know, it's a, it's a mass, but there's a cavitated area in the middle of it in that right upper lobe. And, and just to give you a little further history, no exposures to uh, known person with TB or symptoms of TB, um, no like risk factors like incarceration um, or anything like that was identified and did have a negative uh, control prior to starting um, TNF-alpha in the past. All right, Franco, what do you think? Okay, so after seeing the labs and uh, especially the the chest CT, I will still put high on my differential as small so lung carcinoma that it's one of the that do cavitations. It's the location, it has the risk factor, and that uh, everything that um, the urine out the high ostomy output was kind of noisy, and that is something that I could totally agree that the thing that we need to focus is the pulmonary, the pulmonary mass. Also, I want to point out that even if the patient has a creatinine that has double, he's on AKA, but uh, his electrolytes are normal. So maybe this, this dehydration is not that prolonged. It's just maybe one day or two, because in order to have a really nasty AKA, the electrolytes could be a lot, a lot of um, more uh, depleted. Um, also, 
lymphoma. I could not, lymphopenia could also be a sign of that he's not well nutrition as well as the UN that was not too many, too far elevated. Um, infectious disease are fairly, I think, really less likely. As they point out, there's no actual immunosuppression at this, at this point. Um, I think we are heading in the, that we need, we are heading in the direction that a fiber bronchoscopy and a sample would be needed for that. Beautifully said, Franco. I mean, you really touched on, right now we can define our number one issue as a cavitary lung lesion and just refine the diagnostic diagnostic categories. Um, and again, to me, I, I don't want to anchor too much on sort of the time course being a little more indolent, but at least with the patient not experiencing major symptoms, um, I, I'm wondering if this has been something that's been smoldering a while. So you beautifully hit in the infectious category, right? I, I think even in the absence of TB risk factors, ongoing TNF alpha therapy, mycobacterial disease, but now when we mention particularly TB, right? We have to think about um, endemic fungal conditions, depending on where he is in the world. Um, so thinking about that, if it was in the United States, for example, wondering about histoplasmosis is always important. Whenever you think of pulmonary TB, think of histo also. Um, you know, we talked about um, acute bacterial pneumonia just doesn't make sense now, but making sure we're not missing a bacterial abscess for some reason, I think is quite important. And then uh, you have beautifully tackled sort of the ma malignant um, category. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is, um, a squamous as opposed to small cell that tends to cavitate, but you're right, primary lung cancer, you brought up lymphoma before, this could still be a lymphoma, you know, less likely a metastatic lesion. And then again, we've got our sort of autoimmune category, which we haven't gone into too much, but with this cavitating lesion, again, we mentioned um, uh, granulobinous polyangiitis can do this, and perhaps that'll tie into our kind of renal problem, which is a separate issue. Um, other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, which aren't relevant here. So I think we've got, we've just been able to refine our list of lung pathologies that can do this, but I agree we need some tissue to figure this out. So um, in the sake of time, let's move ahead, uh, Anne-Marie, with what other info you have. Um, so it did get a PET scan that showed that the lesion was hypermetabolic. There was some hypermetabolic um, areas in um, near the ostomy site as well, and some sense of inflammation there. Um, so at this point, um, just due to the location, it was thought not to be amenable to bronchoscopy. Um, so IR was um, consulted for a biopsy of the lesion. Um, it did have a repeat Quant Gold scent that was negative. Um, I was just wondering, kind of thinking about this, is there any serum testing that y'all would want? I can just give you the serum testing, but I didn't know if y'all wanted to kind of brainstorm what you wanted to send. Uh, Nilayan, any, anything come to mind? Um, serum testing, maybe for TB, we can do a TB fillin test. Of if the person does not come from an endemic area, because if the person is coming from an endemic area, tuberculin testing is basically a waste. So if this is a case from US, I expect a tuberculin test to be highly uh, diagnostic or maybe diagnostic. Uh, in India, tuberculin test is totally a waste because almost every second person has latent TB. So every second person, and plus we are vaccinated with BCG as well. So tuberculin has a very high false positivity rate with, tuber with BCG. So yeah, so tuber uh, tuberculin uh, may work may not work, depends uh, on the situation. I'm not aware of the history. Um, apart from that, uh, I think if we are looking for Wegener's um, or Chuck Strauss or uh, autoimmune disorders, then maybe we can have ANCA and ANA of ordered, and maybe that will help. With, that will help. Um, apart from that, uh, well, in the absence of um, race, CRP and uh, ANA, I'm very confused because this does not uh, look like an acute inflammatory state. However, we have um, a diffuse involvement with uh, something uh, which, reflect, uh, which is something reminiscent of fasciitis. And fasciitis can be immune, it can be septic, and if it's septic, uh, or if, it in, if it's infective, then it can be tubercul tuberculous as well. So um, apart from that, um, we have taken a biopsy and we have a hypermetabolic lesion. I'm not sure what the findings of biopsy are. I think we don't have that yet, right? Uh, I see, well, okay, I we don't have it. Henry yeah. wanted us to, uh, to just push ourselves to see if we could somehow make a diagnosis non-invasively. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I agree with everything you're saying, even in, you know, even the, um, the, 
non-tuberculin, basically the interferon uh, gamma release assays and you know, T-spots and quant goals and things like that, it, you know, they're good for screening for latent TB, but in a setting of w when there's a concern for disseminated TB, um, their sensitivity isn't sufficient to rule out the disease. So I think in a case like this, where you suspect that you have to induce sputa, I think serum, you know, blood mycobacterial cultures, stool mycobacterial cultures um, would be indicated. And then as Steph is saying, you know, urine and serum histoantigens that sometimes cross react with the other dimorphic fungi um, as well. Uh, Ankas, as you mentioned, otherwise, uh, Anne-Marie, I, I can't think of any other serum tests that we're missing. I wouldn't get like, you know, uh, cancer markers or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I would just go for tissue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so kind of as far as serum was sent, um, fungal antibodies were sent um, and then a urine histo, um, which the urine histo was negative. The fungal antibodies, um, one of the histo was like positive at just like a very low titer, um, but then the confirmatory tests were negative um, as far as that. Um, crypto, serum crypto antigen was negative as well. And then all the other fungal markers um, were negative. As far as Inca screen, the IFA was positive at a low titer, but the confirmatory PR3 and MPO were negative. Um, so biopsy was obtained um, off antibiotics during this time. Um, as far as the biopsy, AFP was obtained from that that was negative. Um, anaerobic, aerobic culture was negative. Um, fungal culture was negative. And then um, I'll give you the pathology and then we'll, we'll confirm the diagnosis. Um, let me just pull it up really quickly. So surgical pathology showed fibrosis and chronic inflammation um, with focal necrosis and rare multi uh, multinucleated giant cells. Um, and then the stains are negative and then also immunostains uh, for P40 and TTF1 were negative and there was no obvious um, signs of malignancy. And so that's the last aliquot. Franco, any thoughts um, in general or specific to the to the? Uh... Oh, that that was a big reveal over there. There's no malignancy, so I don't know. Maybe giant cells could be seen on granuloma mass without having any negative infection. Titers could be sarcoidosis, could be a, a negative ANCA GPA that could descend like that. Uh, otherwise, I. I couldn't think in, um, anything else. Beautiful. Do you want to share your? Uh, the, the only other thing, it could be all of these things still, I suppose. The only other thing we hadn't mentioned is giant, you know, uh, Langerhans uh, histiocytosis, but um, not, I, I just, that was just like a reflex association with that pathologic finding. But uh, yeah, I know I can present with cavitary lung lesions, but. Um, skin stuff. I didn't know it could have bowel involvement or, or renal involvement, but I don't know too much about the uh, illness script, honestly. All right, Amory, take it away. Let <laughs> us know what's making those multinucleated mm -hmm. giant cells. Yeah, so the thought process was that the final diagnosis was probably the necrobiosis of the lung secondary to Crohn's disease, which can cause cavitary lung lesions um, since kind of every other workup was negative. Unfortunately, I did not have a chance um, kind of some of this was going to follow up with ID, but nothing kind of has come of everything yet. I didn't have a chance to read a little bit more about necrobiosis um, to kind of give you more information, but it can occur in the setting of Crohn's disease as one of the lung manifestations. Obviously, in this case, you would want to evaluate for infectious etiologies, other autoimmune etiologies, and then um, you know, think about malignancy too, kind of prior to making that diagnosis. Um, so that was thought to be um, the most likely diagnosis in this case. Wow, fascinating. So the same, you know, granulobitous inflammatory process of his GI tract affecting the lung. Really interesting. Um, Kirtan, I, you were just doing everything all at once on the board here. Do you want to share just a couple of the teaching points to wrap things up? Yes, sure. So I will try to keep it brief and short. So first we started with the right upper lung mass and the increased osteotomy output. So we were worried about whether this could be infection or whether this could be malignancy. 
Usually we were thinking that cavitary lung mass can be a pivot point. You know, we can start from there and then build our differentials. So we are worrying about some TB, some non-tuberculous mycobacteria infection, some fungal infections. Then Franco even beautifully mentioned that how lymphoma can cause it. So we focused on that part. Then Zevan mentioned that what if these jerking episodes and everything may be not signal the underlying neurological disorder, but may be result of the complication of the underlying process. Things like electrolyte disturbances, hypomagnesemia, hyperkalemia, acute kidney injury, and all the toxins that can build up due to kidney injury can explain the jerking episodes. And in the end, in, in fact, it was true because we are not able to find a foci of any sort of pathology in the brain which can explain the jerking. So we have to assume that those jerking episodes must have been due to underlying metabolic disturbances and not the primary neurological disorder. Then we even mentioned that what if the lung mass is not malignancy or infection? What if it's something like vasculitis, like granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or maybe even sarcoidosis? And then since the patient was on so many meds, we are worried about the stimulant effect and the withdrawal of stimulant medications. The patient even was on atrial. So we are worried about what if these jerking episodes are due to this withdrawal effect. But we were not able to zoom in on those findings later on. And finally, the labs also not revealed, didn't reveal anything. The ostomy output didn't reveal much. And in the labs, we are worried about the lymphopenia. But as it turns out, it, it can all be attributed to the Crohn's causing colitis and maybe some cause of protein losing enteropathy. But we are not able to find the perfect cause for lymphopenia. And lymphopenia was not actually that striking too. So we were not much worried about that. And finally, to tie all together, if we look at the pivot point, so there was cavitary lung mass. Then there is the patient has past medical history of Crohn's patient is not on any medications and the patient then has increased ostomy output. So if we think, you know, if we zoom out and if we focus that what can be this, so first assumption in any disease, we have to think about what if the underlying disease itself is, you know, flaring up because if you are not on medications, then autoimmune diseases like Crohn's can flare up at any time. And if you just think like that, that what if Crohn's is flaring and first thing that will come to our mind is diarrhea because it's a bowel disease. If the Crohn's flare up, then it will manifest as diarrhea. There is no other way. So that was one thing. And finally, the lung part. So this is very interesting. I'm not uh, unsure where I read that, but if I am correct, then in one of the case reports in NHM, the patient had all sorts of reticuloendothelial infiltrates in the lung along with the cavitary lung lesion and the patient had Crohn's disease. So they were initially worried about the pathologies which can mimic the Crohn's. So all the things that we mentioned like TB, histoplasmosis, sarcoidosis, they even mentioned the Bechet's disease because Bechet's disease can sometimes cause pulmonary infarction and cavitary lesions as well as the bowel infarction. But ultimately, even in that case of NHM, the final diagnosis was something known as pulmonary Crohn's disease. So as far as I know, pulmonary Crohn's disease can manifest in two ways. One is LIP, that is lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis, very similar to what we see in Sjogren's and rheumatoid arthritis. And another manifestation is these cavitary lung lesions. So Crohn's disease can even manifest in this way. It's very, very rare, but I'm sure that there was an NHM article for that. I need to brush it up and remember that what was the true pathogenesis for that. And it was a very interesting case. Thank you so much, and Mary, for presenting. And Steph and Javan, do you have any final, you know, teaching points that what are the things we shouldn't miss while dealing with such case? No, Kirsten, you did you did an amazing job uh, multitasking, scribing, and that was just some uh, amazing knowledge you just dropped at the end. Thank you. Uh, I, I have the up-to-date article of pulmonary complications of inflammatory bowel disease pulled up, and uh, excited to learn more about this later. Thank you uh, so much, Anne Marie, for the case. Um, uh, Franco uh, and the lion for, for discussing. Um, Y'all have a great week. Uh, we'll see you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye.